Hello, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you could take the time from your day to join us. My name is Marcia Steinberg and I will be moderating today. Today, Ken will be speaking about the after effects of the Russian invasion on the Ukraine. As usual, his presentation will take about 15 to 20 minutes and then we're gonna go right into Q&A. So please be prepared with some questions. We wanna have a lively discussion and he'll be happy to answer whatever you have to throw at him. We're gonna go till five o'clock or until we're out of questions. And uh, wanna talk a little bit about our upcoming events. Our next Ask the Chairman webinar will be on May 3rd. It's a Tuesday this time. We've been doing them on Thursdays. This next one will be on Tuesday, Tuesday, May 3rd at 4 p.m. And then our in-person seminars have ended for the season and they'll be starting up again on November 6th. That's a Sunday, November 2022. I know it's a ways away. We'll remind you again, just to let you know. Also, please check our website, www.cfns.us. There's lots of good information there. And uh, enjoy our presentation. Uh, to start you off, as usual, we have a poll. One moment. Who do you think are the losers in this situation? Israel, Russia, Taiwan, or Ukraine? I see you chiming in. We have a few different opinions going on here. Anyone else? Another couple seconds. Well, we have 42% that think Russia is a loser, 8% for Taiwan, and 50% for Ukraine. All right, we're going to give you one more. The next one is, once we talked about the losers, who are the winners? China, Europe, Iran, or the USA? Okay. Give a couple more seconds here. Almost everybody's chimed in. You guys are quick. All right, we have 69% think that China's the big winner and 31% Iran. The rest are uh, zero Europe and zero USA. Thank you for playing along. And with that, I will pass it off to Ken. Hello, Ken. Uh, thank you very much, Marsha. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, joining us uh, today for some uh, intellectual fun and games for about an hour. I'm going to speak, as Marsha mentioned, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes and then answer some questions. So you have plenty of time to ask some questions. The, um, uh, before I start, I, I want to show a, a slide um, exhibit. I just have one today. So uh, uh, Marsha, uh, th thank you. Now, I, um, I, I want to go through this. And, but first, uh, let me just mention where it has my contact information. I added, um, I, I, I manage two organizations, Save the West and CFNS, and they're, they're both interrelated. They're both a little different, mostly similar, uh, but both, uh, all of you should sign up for both of them because uh, we have different activities at different times. And uh, together, you know, you'll get a um, reasonably, what I think is a of uh, the mess uh, facing all of us. And uh, uh, obviously you have your contact, my contact information and anyone's welcome to contact me anytime uh, by uh, uh, email or by cell phone if you wanna chat or if you want me to speak to some organization in uh, Florida. And, um, and, and, and also uh, those of you who might be going to Israel, I'm gonna be spending a couple of months uh, in Israel and there's uh, 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 several interesting trips in May and June. If some of you could be persuaded, uh, some of you going to Israel or could be persuaded to go to Israel, 
and you want to chat about some of these uh, missions, also email me or call me. Okay, so what I um, want to uh, delve into is further implications of this Ukraine-Russia war. And I'm going to look at it uh, on a uh, color-coded basis, so to speak, uh, through the point of view of good guys and bad guys. And uh, uh, we're going to be discussing the bad guys, who are the reds, greens, and blues. The reds are the communists or authoritarian governments. <clears throat> the greens are the uh, Islamist countries. The United Nations is really a symbolic uh, color-coded blue. That's the colors of the United Nations. Uh, but uh, this is the globalist category. Uh, this also includes uh, the Davos people, the uh, New World Order uh, people, uh, the Great Reset people, World Economic Forum, and a whole variety of uh, worldwide lunatics, uh, as well as uh, much of corporate America, particularly the high technology companies, Facebook, Twitter, Google, who are suppressing freedom of speech um, by listening to illegal orders uh, of the federal government. Also, be discussing uh, us, the centrists, uh, where the sunlight, the sunshine of Western the rule of law, uh, both secular and religious. Uh, we'll discuss the, what I call the good guys. Also, discuss it from the point of view of the whites, the isolationist color white for the surrender flag. Uh, these uh, people are not evil, and they're not the reds, the greens, and the blues who are evil. Uh, these are just normal people sitting in their normal house with their normal family, and someone like me or you uh, comes to them physically or on television or radio and says, Mr. A homeowner, I want to discuss Ukraine, Russia, Taiwan, China, uh, um, Israel, Iran, uh, uh, Nigeria, Christians getting killed by Muslims in Nigeria. And then the person says, look, buddy, uh, I, I have to get my kids to sleep. I have to do some preparation for my job tomorrow, and I have to go to work tomorrow and be in the office by 9 o'clock. I don't want to listen to any of this. Goodbye. I don't know where these countries are, and I don't know, and I don't care. So those I call isolationists. So let's look at it first uh, from the uh, bad guy point of view. Let's look at it from the, red, the Reds. Now, the Reds uh, uh, would include China, Russia, Korea. And, and bear in mind that the reds, the greens, and the blues are worldwide in scope. So even though it might say on the map that Russia is wherever Russia is, that doesn't mean they're not here in the U.S. And similarly for China uh, and, uh, and uh, all the bad guys, the, all the bad guys now are worldwide in scope. And, and this page I call World War III, and this is different from World War II. In World War II, if we were talking in 1942, I'd say to you, well, Germany's over there and Japan's over there, and that's where the war is. Uh, let's let's have dinner and have a good time. Uh, today, in World War III, half of the war is inside the country, half of the war is outside the country. Logical question is, when did World War III begin? And uh, the the Reds, the Communist Socialist uh, Progressives, who are actually regressive, uh, that war began about a hundred years ago. Vladimir Lenin. To Ill illegally took control over Russia through an electoral coup and, and de declared war on Western civilization. That was a, about 100 years ago. The Greens uh, declared war on us 1,400 years ago when Muhammad and his followers decided to and uh, took over about a third of the world at that time. The uh, Blues declared war on us about 100 years ago through the League of Nations, uh, which then morphed into the United Nations. So that war has been going on uh, for 100 years. And the Whites uh, uh, indirectly declared war on us, uh, um, so to speak, since the beginning of mankind. So I, I have a joke about this. Uh, uh, just pretend uh, uh, half of us on this phone are living in one cave and the other half are living in another cave. And the uh, other half comes running to us and say, help, help, help. There's a lot of bad guys. Please come out of your cave and help me in my cave. Well, we would have one of two um, responses. One is uh, either a white or a yellow response. 
so to speak, in my terminology. So a white response would be, well, your problem with your cave is your problem. It's not my problem. They're attacking you, not me. And hopefully uh, they'll never find me. And so why should I and my friends here risk our lives to save you? That's what a white would say. A yellow would say, uh, I, again, color-coded for the sunshine, sunlight, the sun, uh, would say, well, uh, after they attack your cave, they may well attack our cave. So we're going to come and help you because we have a common enemy and let's work together. And so that re that difference in response has been going on since the beginning of mankind. So you could say that war is as old as however you think old you think humans are. That war has been going on. So anyways, now let's focus on the issue. Let's look at the uh, the Reds. So from the Reds' point of view, in particular Russia's point of view, this is unmitigated disaster. It's it's the largest. Uh, I'm not a tennis player, but they call it an unforced error. When you, when you hit the ball into the net, uh, it's unforced error. This was the largest unforced error uh, uh, in recent times, or maybe of all times, of of uh, uh, basically Russia shooting itself in the foot by launching this uh, ill-advised uh, uh, adventure and uh, poorly planned. And although uh, I have a very high regard for Putin's intellect, I, I think he outsmarted himself. He, he thought it was too easy. He thought America would, would never fight, which is a good guess. He thought NATO would never fight, which is a good guess. And he thought he would just walk into Ukraine and all be over in three days. And he, he'd have 44 million people, uh, Christians, as part of his uh, uh, country. There's only about 150 million people in Russia. He would have gone instantly to about 200 million people. Uh, he thought it was would be easy because everyone was so afraid of Putin and so afraid of the Russian army. And of course, he, he never checked with the Ukrainian people. He never checked with Zelensky. And he never even checked with his army to ask them, are you sure you can do this? Do you know how to do this? And so it, it, it was just a uh, massive uh, error and Russia will be paying the penalty for this, uh, certainly for the uh, lifetime, political lifetime of Putin until some new person comes in and uh, <coughs> resurrects uh, Russia's relationship with the world. But uh, the, the war crimes that they're committing is just causing everybody to uh, distance themselves or leave Russia. And Russia has become instantly a pariah state has lost its superpower status. Its uh, military is a, a, a joke. It's a laughing stock of the world. And, and, and it's embarrassment that is uh, unbelievable. Uh, and um, in looking at some of the other reds for China, I put this as a neutral. Uh, there's elements of it that are positive and elements that are negative. From the negative point of view, uh, China and Russia are uh, brothers, so to speak. Uh, and it certainly doesn't reflect well if, if one of your brothers uh, is a war criminal. So uh, I think it uh, that hurts China. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Russia used to be a superpower, and they basically you know, shot themselves in the foot. So now it's really only two superpowers in the world, uh, China and America. So from China's point of view, that's probably good. So uh, I, I would say, by and large, it's uh, 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 also, China does not um, produce its own energy in sufficient quantities, so they have to pay high prices for oil and natural gas from other people. So I'd say a, a net neutral for China. And, and also, um, it, it shows uh, people's respect for dictators probably just fell precipitously when they saw Putin as a dictator out of control. Uh, probably doesn't reflect well on China's uh, dictatorship. The one communist country that benefits is Venezuela. Uh, it's a communist country. You could just say it's a criminal organization pretending to be a government of a country. And, and, and now the U.S. is trying to encourage them to sell oil, to break America's own boycott and sell oil, natural gas to America. So I, I'd say this is uh, probably good, good for Venezuela, uh, neutral to China, disastrous for Russia. <laughs> let's, go, let's go to the Greens. The Greens. Uh, uh, the Islamists, this would be Iran, 
uh, and on the Shiite side and on the Sunni side, Turkey and Qatar are supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. So uh, it would be them also. So I would say this is good for the Greens. It's good for Iran, because like Venezuela, uh, uh, America's uh, in Europe wants them to sell oil and natural gas, even though they run the largest terror organization in the history of the world, with over 400,000 worldwide terrorists in three separate terror organizations, physical, um, cultural, and narco terrorism. And, um, and it's Turkey and Qatar are supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the second largest terror organization behind Iran. And, uh, and they, everyone wants Qatar's uh, natural gas and oil. Uh, and, and Turkey is a unreliable uh, NATO uh, member, but it is playing a somewhat responsible role, uh, not allowing Russian ships to leave the Black Sea is um, basically a declaration of war against Russia. So I would say um, uh, Iran, Turkey, and Qatar look better uh, out of this mess. So let's say it's positive for them. Let's go to the blues. The Blues, the United Nations is uh, ineffective, always was ineffective, uh, shouldn't really exist, never should have been set up. Uh, uh, I think countries should be responsible for their own affairs. We don't need a superstructure United Nations. So the, the whole organization never should have happened and should be closed down and it's ineffective, has done nothing useful. So uh, they, uh, I'd say things look worse for the UN. For the high technology companies, uh, um, it, it's neutral. I don't think it really affects uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, uh, because they, they're primarily involved in the cultural war against America, not, not a physical war. And uh, the other part of the globalists, uh, you can call them the new world order types, uh, the Great Reset, uh, World Economic Forum, the Davos, all of these are basically worldwide communist lunatics. Uh, it gives them excuse to say, you see, the world's a big mess. And the reason it's a big mess is we need uh, basically United Nations on steroids uh, run by very smart people, in quotes, who uh, basically want to be our, our dictator, worldwide dictators. So um, whenever you have chaos, things look good when uh, people speak eloquent nonsense and that encourages some people to be interested. So I'd say. This mess is, is good for the blues, good for the greens, uh, bad for the reds. Let's go to the uh, whites, the isolationists. I think the, this war is as bad for the whites. I think the isolationists look bad, uh, particularly those um, on either, in either party who are saying, uh, basically, Ukraine has nothing to do with us. It's not part of NATO. I don't, I don't know where it is. I don't care where it is. Uh, we shouldn't be sending troops. <laughs> Then there was never a debate about sending troops. The issue was sending weapons. But these people look uh, aloof and care, uh, callous uh, for uh, basically seeing a slaughter of fellow uh, Christians. Uh, remember, America is a 90% Christian country, uh, as is Ukraine. To be watching fellow Christians kill fellow Christians and have Christians here say it has nothing to do with me. Uh, I think is pretty bad. So I'd say things, uh, the isolationists have been discredited in this mess. And then let's go to us, we the people, uh, the sunshine, sunlight, uh, what I call rational centrists. Uh, in Europe, uh, this is good news for Europe. Europe has finally been jarred to come to its senses. Uh, Germany has announced they're spending $100 billion to uh, build their military. They're going to spend 2% of GDP, which President Trump asked them to do, and they laughed hysterically, you know, real funny. And, 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 and now they were just about to get invaded, and now all of a sudden they're coming to their senses. Uh, NATO's become more cohesive because there's a big bad wolf, so to speak, outside the door. Uh, this is uh, also good news uh, looking at normal countries or democracies. This is good news for Taiwan. I think if I were running China, I would think uh, several times over of whether I want to invade Taiwan. But when I see the disaster that Putin is creating for Ukraine and for himself and for the Russian people, uh, I think a Chinese leader will be very hesitant to invade Taiwan 
uh, after watching uh, uh, the disaster for the Russian uh, military and for the Russian leadership. For the U.S., it, it's it's more or less a, a neutral, slight positive, because we're on the winning side. Uh, we should have been more on the winning side. We should have been shipping many more weapons much earlier to the Ukraine, uh, much more lethal weapons. So we didn't do it. It still will get credit because at least we did uh, show up with a lot of aid belatedly uh, for Ukraine. I think originally uh, Biden administration was going to give Ukraine to Russia as a present. And I think they had worked out a deal to do that. And, and that's why the U.S. wasn't supplying Ukraine with weapons, <coughs> of uh, lethal weapons before. And, and uh, as you know, publicly, the State Department uh, offered Zelensky a free ride home, uh, so to speak. And, and Zelensky said one of the most famous words of our time, uh, I, I don't need a ride, I need weapons. I need ammunition. And uh, Zelensky was right, and the U.S. government was wrong, and the U.S. government was basically trying to collapse the country and hand it over to Russia. <coughs> Why? It's, it's beyond comprehension, but I don't regard our current leaders as either very smart or very uh, loyal to the country. So the um, so, but anyways, for the U.S., this would be a neutral to positive. This mess, uh, because one of our competitors or enemies or adversaries, whatever word you want to use to describe Russia, uh, has been uh, more, more near mortally wounded, so to speak. And and finishing out uh, the rational centrists or the democracies or what I call normal countries, uh, Israel. This is a uh, big problem for Israel. Even though Israel had nothing to do with Ukraine, nothing to do with Russia, other than having friendly relations with the two of them, uh, Israel tries to have friendly relations with every country except its uh, its key lunatic enemies. And but the reason it's a negative is everyone wants more oil and natural gas. Well, we discussed how uh, Venezuela criminal organization is now being asked to uh, ship uh, uh, products to America. So if you think that that's a logical thing to do, you might as well go to the Iranian criminal organization and ask them for natural gas and oil. Uh, so, uh, and, and while you're at it, a uh, new Iranian nuclear deal, which if it looks anything like the old Iranian nuclear deal, uh, basically gives Iran nukes in uh, three to 10 years, depending upon various categories of uh, weaponry. So I'd say all of this is bad for Israel uh, inadvertently, uh, just because uh, uh, the uh, Europe is reaching and America reaching out irrationally to uh, Iran to reach some sort of accommodation. Whereas I have a rule: you don't negotiate with terrorists. There's nothing America has to say to Iran uh, when you're dealing with professional terror organizations. You basically uh, deal with them the same way lion tamers in the circus if we ever have a circus again in this country, uh, the way lion tamers <coughs> used to deal with lions. You, you basically just keep whipping them till they do what you want them to do. And that's the only way to negotiate with a lion and it's the only way to negotiate with terror organizations. So anyways, I think I'll, I'll stop here. That's my quick uh, look at this mess from the point of view of the reds, the greens, and the blues, and then the uh, uh, good guys ourselves and then the isolationists who are not evil people, they just need to uh, be uh, better educated. So, um, Marsha, you can take the slide away <laughs> and let's uh, see what we have for questions uh, from people. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. Um, all right, so uh, looking for anybody that uh, wants to put their questions in, please uh, do so now. Uh, we have one thing coming up here. Uh, well, what do you think Putin should do now? <laughs> um, I think Putin should get out of this mess as fast as humanly possible. Um, and uh, now he wants to be able to declare victory. I, I don't know how you declare victory after you kill so many uh, women, children, and men, and civilians. Uh, but, uh, you know, nowadays you can declare anything you want. So uh, uh, I, I think his strategy is uh, basically to take over eastern Ukraine, roughly a third of the country, which I'm told 
that has 10% of the population, but 90% of the energy reserves, whether it's oil or natural gas. I'm also told that the Black Sea has big potential natural gas reserves. So, uh, uh, and, and he, it, and it looks like he's moving troops out of the center of the country and moving them to the east. So I think he wants to basically conquer the uh, eastern third, uh, which is mostly Russian speakers and, uh, and full of energy reserves. And I think he wants Odessa, which is uh, an important uh, port on the Black Sea. So he'll have total control over the Black Sea uh, energy reserves. He will have denied uh, Ukraine a, 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 um, a port. And it's a way to punish Ukraine for not surrendering in three days. And, um, and so I, I'll, I'll just guess that in a month, uh, he'll declare victory and, and uh, basically try to take uh, control over the eastern third of the country. And, um, but uh, I, I would want to end this mess. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's it's fun to be a war criminal, and I don't think it's fun to have uh, be a pariah in the world, and uh, I don't think it's fun to have destroyed Russian prestige. Uh, Russia has a very proud culture of a thousand years or so, and uh, and uh, Putin made him look like a uh, like a Hitler, Stalin, Mao, lunatic. So uh, I'd want to cut my losses as much as possible. Putin probably is saying to himself, if I stop the war today, I'll look like a war criminal and a failure, and, uh, and I'll end up getting deposed. So I have to have some sort of, a, in quotes, a victory or something I can say is, was good for Mother Russia uh, before I stop fighting. So uh, I, I want this war to end like today, uh, but hopefully it ends in, in a month. And, and Russia takes uh, whatever they can take, and Ukraine will be upset about it, but the killing will be over, and and people can, I won't say go back to normal because it's going to cost, uh, I don't know, I saw an estimate four hundred billion dollars to fix up the disaster in Ukraine, and who's going to pay for that? And um, so, anyways, to answer the question for Putin, <laughs> get get out of this mess as fast as humanly possible. Okay. What else? Okay, moving on. Uh, does Europe still need Russia's oil and gas? Well, it, it doesn't, doesn't. Uh, uh, roughly ha 40 to 50 percent of Europe's natural gas and oil comes from Russia. So they got themselves way too dependent. And uh, President Trump warned them of that. And I saw uh, videos where the, the, uh, Trump's counterparts were just laughing at him. Okay, well, now it's not a laughing matter. Uh, these uh, European countries were run by uh, total morons, and it's embarrassing to watch such uh, malpractice in government uh, management. And uh, so, but better late than never, and Europe's coming to its senses, uh, realizes that it, it has to invest in itself and its military. Uh, has to have a strong NATO and has to be able to make decisions on a faster basis. So um, so I, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of Germany, so to speak. Uh, Germany's uh, publicly said they're going to invest $100 billion in their military. That's better late than never, but at least they're doing it. They announced that they're going to suspend or, or cancel the Nord Stream 2 pipeline the almost $10 billion pipeline from Russia to uh, uh, Northern Europe. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit proud of Germany. I mean, they could have made these decisions before this disaster, but at least they're making the decisions now. The next thing I, I'd like Germany to do is restart its nuclear plants. Its nuclear plants used to be roughly a third uh, of uh, energy in, in the country, they're down to 15% nuclear. I would restart their old nuclear plants, which I'm told uh, uh, operate fine. They prematurely closed them um, uh, irrationally uh, due to pressure from the environmentalists who, who were getting paid off by Russia and the KGB. 
So they, they listened to this false narrative from Russia and, and um, basically disarmed their uh, nuclear plants. So they, they have to reverse that decision. Um, I don't think they have re reversed that decision, so they still have uh, more to go. But um, okay, what else do you have? We have some more questions here. Uh, despite your arguments for post-invasion Putin goals, which is the present in the condition, I'm sorry, uh, what is the present consideration by the UN? I agree with your position on the UN. So what is the present consideration to reconsider Russia's position on committees and even Security Council? Well, there is, um, as I said before, the UN never should have been set up. It's, it violates of countries, if constitution, the Constitution uh, of America, and I'm sure similar countries, says that the president's the commander in chief. It's not the commander in chief if the UN agrees or is subject to the Security Council. It's the president's the commander in chief. Uh, 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 so I don't recognize any organization that infringes on the US Constitution. So first, the UN should be closed. But assuming you say, oh, well, we can't close the UN, uh, 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 I think any terror organization should not be in the UN. So I would use this as an excuse not only to kick uh, Russia out, uh, but there's no reason in the world that Iran, the number one criminal organization in the world, the number one terror organization in the world is in the UN. Um, so I would probably uh, use it as an excuse to uh, throw them out of the UN and throw Russia out of the Security Council. Now, the lawyers, I'm sure, will say, you can't do that. You, you, America doesn't have the power to kick Russia out of the UN or out of the Security Council. And so, so uh, there's some push to push uh, Russia out of the Human Rights uh, Council, but the Human Rights Council is full of criminals, <laughs> so uh, I would I would just kick Russia out. I kick everyone else out of the human rights organization because I don't think any country, um, uh, with the with the exception of Israel and a few others, uh, could actually uh, defend their human rights. Um, I mean, the the U.S. right now is one of the largest violators of human rights. Uh, we've lost our freedom of speech, and the last time I read the Constitution. It said that the freedom of speech is not to be infringed. So I think America's a human rights um, violator. So, but if you use that, there, there, there won't be any countries left in the U. Almost no countries left in the UN because most countries are basically, I hate to say this, uh, corrupt. And um, so, uh, but but Russia should be punished in in any number of ways possible to uh, not only punish, punish them, but also set an example to, to China, that if you pull the stunt of taking over Iran, uh, taking over Taiwan, and, and if Iran pulls the stunt of developing uh, nuclear weapons and long range ballistic missile systems, we're going to knock you out of the family of nations. So I think it's, it's um, good to set an example uh, for Russia of what happens to rogue countries that, uh, um, uh, get out, uh, are out of control and beat up their neighbors. All right, we have some more questions here. Uh, in your opinion, uh, is there any way that Ukraine can win? And if so, how long will it take for Ukraine to win? Well, how long will it? Uh, I mean, Ukraine uh, won, you could say, as of right now, and j just by fighting off. Uh, uh, the, the Russian army. Uh, so you could say it's a victory. Although if you look at the pictures of the damage in the, in the dead people, you, you'd be hard pressed to say that that was a victory. Uh, but uh, assuming you were gonna get beaten up uh, irrationally by Russia and, and you stood your ground and uh, no other nation sent any troops to help you and you did it all by yourself, with the help of arms, yes, from NATO in America, yes, uh, but um, it's it's a real tribute to the people of Ukraine, and it's a real people, uh, it's a real uh, tribute to Zelensky, 
and Zelensky will be the, the man of the year or the man of the decade. Uh, he's going to go down in history as uh, one of the most famous quotes ever. <laughs> when he said to the U.S. State Department, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. So uh, I'd say Zelensky's star is shining bright in this mess. And um, I hope the Russians don't kill him. And uh, he, he, uh, when, I, when I think back at the past 200 years, sometimes I, I'm having dinner with friends and I say, oh, uh, let's count up all the great leaders of the past one or 200 years, recent history. We can't even get to 10. We have to challenge ourselves to get to 10 great world leaders of different countries at different times. Uh, of people in the stature of Abraham Lincoln or, or Reagan or Thatcher or Winston Churchill, uh, Netanyahu. Uh, it's not like the world is full of people of this stature. Well, Zelensky just reached into the pantheon of great leaders in the past uh, one or 200 years. And uh, I hope he, he lives, survives, and, and uh, rejuvenates his country. He said something very interesting in the last couple of days. I didn't read the speech, but I saw the headline, and I sort of guessed what was in the speech. I'll, I'll read the speech shortly. He said, we want to be like Israel. And I said, good idea, because what was he really saying? Uh, Israel is landlocked, in effect, by its enemies. Uh, doesn't have natural resources until recently when they found natural gas offshore. And Israel was forced to rely on their brains and, uh, and forced to create good universities, forced to create good medical schools, forced to create good scientists and engineers and, 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 and basically use their brains to get out of the mess that they were in. And, and what uh, uh, Zelensky is in effect saying is, I, I need a similar strategy. Uh, he won't say this, but I'm probably going to lose my oil and natural gas to Russia. I'm going to lose a lot of my grain to uh, the high cost of fertilizer and inability of my farmers to, to plant and harvest. So uh, I, I'm going to have to get out of this mess when the war ends. I'm going to have to get out of this by using my brain and, and my, the brain of my fellow countrymen. And, and we're going to have to become a, a, an innovative little Israel and uh, to succeed in the world. I, I thought that was very, a very encouraging thought from uh, Zelensky. What else All do you right. have? Switching channels here. Uh, can you explain how this administration is using Russian negotiators to talk to the mullahs in Iran? Well, this is uh, unconscionable that the world's superpower is negotiating with Iran indirectly. Because Iran said, well, look, you, you left the, the JCPOA, you left the Iran agreement, uh, so, so therefore we, we can't negotiate with you directly. We were only negotiating with other members of the JCPOA, but you can negotiate indirectly through someone like Russia. You, you, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, the world's superpower, is negotiating with the number one terror organization in the history of the world, and the terror organization dictates the terms of, of who's going to meet who and where? Hello? Uh, so this is, um, for America to agree to this silliness means uh, America is going to lose the negotiation by definition. So the question is, why would you want to negotiate with someone when you're going to lose by definition? because I would argue, because you want to lose. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, one of the newspapers in, interviewed uh, Prince Bindar, the former um, uh, Saudi Arabian ambassador to the US. And, and just after the JCPOA was agreed to, it was never signed, but they agreed to it verbally as, as if it carries any weight. And he said, this deal is so bad that America had to have wanted to lose in particular the Obama administration at that time. He said America had to have won to lose because you don't go into a negotiation and lose this badly uh, unless you want to lose this badly. <laughs> so I would argue this new agreement, we only know tidbits about it, but it looks like um, I, I still regard Obama as the president. And I think Obama said uh, uh, we're going to lose again in the new agreement. 
And uh, of course, when we get a, a new president, uh, they're going to rip up the agreement and we'll be uh, <laughs> back to where we were. Uh, but um, we shouldn't be negotiating with the terror organization. And if we are, we should be negotiating with them directly. And um, I have a joke about this. The, the only way to negotiate with a terror organization is you talk and talk and talk. And then when 587 planes show up on the radar screen of the bad guys and they're 10, 10, 10 minutes away, from blowing up the country back into the Stone Age, the negotiations will begin in the last 10 minutes. And uh, But until those 587 airplanes are in the air, on the radar screens, and about to drop their bombs on Iran's nuclear sites, there'll be no serious negotiations, only surrender. So then now you know why you bring Russia in, because you want to surrender, but you'll blame it on Russia. And, and uh, also, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, the administration will be allowing Russia to evade sanctions uh, by laundering money through Iran. So you say, so why, why is America putting sanctions on Russia and then allowing Russia to get out of the sanctions uh, through the Iran deal? And it comes back to the what Prince Bindar said. If, you, if these are negotiations designed to lose to Iran and lose to Russia and um, and so we have the wrong people negotiating and the wrong people leading the negotiations. It's an embarrassment for America that we have a government of, of such low caliber. All right, we have another question and thank you for your participation, everybody. We will have time for another couple of questions if you wanna throw something in the chat there. Uh, the next one we have here is how can Putin ever be held accountable for atrocities and war crimes committed in the Ukraine. Do you think there can ever be successful Nuremberg type trials to prosecute him? Well, you took you took the word right out of my mouth. I was just about to say we should we need another uh, Nuremberg trial uh, set up. And uh, so you beat me to it. Uh, yes, that, that's what I would do. I, I would set up uh, a Nuremberg trial uh, in America. Uh, uh, and and try him, so to speak. I mean, not that we can do anything. We're not going to send, uh, you know, eight policemen to to uh, handcuff him and, and, and extra, extradite him to the uh, to the Nuremberg trial in, in Washington D.C. or wherever it is. So, but it, it's more of a show trial. It's a more to embarrass him, and it's more to put pressure on his colleagues to. Uh, eliminate him hopefully not kill him i don't i don't like leaders getting killed so to speak uh, but hopefully remove him and replace him with someone who's uh, more normal and then have russia uh, join the world community as a normal country again so i, I think putin has to go um, I, by the way i have a very high regard for putin i, I listened to him many times on youtube and every time I listen to him, he's delightful, he's smart, he's insightful, he's uh, every quality. Uh, I spent a lot of time in corporate America. He's just as smart or smarter than anyone running Johnson & Johnson and Merck and Pfizer and any other great company that you can think of. And it's a pleasure. Uh, unfortunately, he outsmarted himself and he walked into a trap that he created and is now in a quagmire. And I don't see how he gets out of with his career and power intact. And um, you know, I, I look at leaders a little bit like I look at pitchers when I watch baseball games. You can have the greatest pitcher for seven innings, but when his arm is tired and the bases are loaded, you need a you need a fresh pitcher in there. And this is time for a relief pitcher to come in, uh, so to speak, and and uh, fix up this this mess. All right, we have another very good question here. Do we know who was involved in the biolabs in the Ukraine that look very similar to the ones in China? Yeah, it's certainly mysterious that the U.S. was financing biolabs uh, in China and in um, Ukraine. And in America, we, we have rules against uh, bioweapons. There's some treaty somewhere that we signed. And um, so we don't want to, in quotes, violate it. 
So it seems like what we do is we ship money to uh, other people, uh, China as an adversary, <laughs> Ukraine as a friend, and have them conduct some biological weapon, uh, I, I assume weapon research, they, maybe they, they would say it's not uh, for weaponry, it's just for understanding the viruses. And um, so it certainly is uh, pretty mysterious uh, how that came about. So uh, I, I was told, but I have to check into it, that these labs were, were in place uh, in the Ukraine uh, uh, well before America uh, was involved. And um, I mean, could they have been developing biological weapons? Well, they did give up their nuclear weapons, I believe in 1994. So it would be logical for them to look at biological weapons as a, um, some sort of a substitute uh, to protect them uh, if Russia were to invade. It certainly didn't help them very much. Uh, bear in mind with biological weapons, you can't control them as well as you can control a, a, a real bomb, uh, obviously. You, so you, you, can, you can hurt Russian invading soldiers. You also can hurt yourself when you unleash uh, biological agents, as we saw when China declared war on the U.S. in uh, late uh, 2019 and shipped the COVID um, a virus to America. Well, uh, they're now getting, uh, uh, they, uh, I, th I think half of Shanghai is closed down as um, the, the virus, they thought they could export it, uh, but they ended up uh, uh, importing it at the same time. And now they have a big COVID problem, uh, which they created uh, as a biological weapon with gain of function research to uh, basically undermine the US and cause regime change, which they caused. So, but now, uh, they, they're going to be uh, pay for their own COVID. And, um, and then they developed the vaccine, which is less effective than our vaccine. And so the people are less protected than uh, our Americans are protected. All right. Uh, what else? Yeah. Anything else? Yes, we do have others. Millions of Ukrainian citizens have fled due to the war. They're seeking to enter the U.S. through the southern U.S. border. The Biden administration is looking to open and unsecure this border even more in May of this year. Can anything be done to stop an even more chaotic flood of refugees, legitimate and illegitimate, at the southern U.S. border? Well, it, 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 yeah, a lot of things can be done, but not by this administration. <laughs> this administration has made the decision to allow a, uh, America to be invaded by our enemies. So the America is going through a full scale invasion right now to the tune of two to three million people per year. I'll guess the 10% of them are drug dealers, criminals, uh, terrorists, uh, terrorist recruiters. And if this continues for four years, we'll have 10 or 15 million people, uh, let's say roughly 1 million criminals. And we'll have, uh, if you think we have a national security uh, or a criminal problem now, wait. Uh, and I think it, it's designed to create chaos, but it's also designed to create uh, future voters. So I think the administration has decided that they can't get reelected by Americans. And so therefore it has to elect, has to uh, bring in uh, non-Americans who do not know the Constitution and Bill of Rights, do not know our culture, who do not believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for 100% of the population. And they've decided that they're going to let them in, give them the right to vote, and then steal the election. That's, I believe, what their strategy is. And I don't see any way to stop them until the midterm elections in November, when um, I, the Republicans take over the House and the Senate and uh, literally will force the government to stop the foreign invasion that they have created. This is a pretty sad moment in America where the federal government is the largest human trafficker in the world. Our US government is the largest human trafficker in the world by allowing the southern border to be open. Okay. Um, if they are ignoring the Interpol notices on Iran's government for the AMIA bombing, embassy bombing, Marine barracks bombing, 1088 massacre, Syrian genocide, Russia's role too, and the role in 9-11, why would they not go on to ignore Putin? Did this not empower him? 
And is the double standard between Russia and Iran not one of the most problematic double standards in history? <laughs> That's a very thoughtful question. Uh, the question, uh, rephrasing the question, why is the current um, rogue U.S. government uh, basically supporting the Iranian terror organization and is playing tough with the Russian terror organization? How could that be? Uh, another way of saying, using my terminology of reds, greens, and blues, uh, why is the gov our government uh, basically playing nice with the greens and, and being tough? not with all the reds, but with the Russian reds and not the Chinese reds. Um, I'll give you my best guess. As I said before, I think Obama's really the president and Obama's Muslim and, and she, and he's favoring and his team are favoring the Iranians, the, the Shiites. Uh, the Muslims are roughly 85% Sunni, 15% Shiite. They've been fighting for 1400 years over who were the real Muslims. And Obama's decided that the Shiites are the real Muslims and is uh, supporting them in their fight against the Sunnis. And so I, I think it's, it's o o Obama's Muslim and, and Shiite and has made the decision to be to help uh, uh, Iran. I think he wants Iran to have nuclear weapons. I think he thinks it's unfair that the Shiites do not have nuclear weapons and everybody else has nuclear weapons. And so I think the goal is to get to allow them to have nuclear weapons, and uh, and 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 they just use uh, 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 Russia as a. Um, um, I don't think they have the same affinity to Russia that they have to Iran. That's the only way I can explain it. Okay, we've come to the end of our questions here, and I thank everyone who participated and joined in. Um, and uh, we want to remind you that Tuesday, May 3rd at 4 p.m. is our next uh, session. We'd love to see you all there. Anything else? Closing remarks, Ken? Uh, yes, I'll also remind people if you uh, want me to speak to uh, some local group that you're involved with, uh, uh, let me know. If you're thinking of coming to Israel, let me know. If you ever want to get together with me separately, uh, let me know. And uh, and uh, thank you, Marsha, for your efforts in uh, putting the uh, 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 webinar together. And uh, I hope everyone has an enjoyable summer. And I hope our paths cross whenever it suits you. To you, let me know, and our paths will cross. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody.